Hello and welcome to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. On today's podcast, I sit down with my friend and colleague Celia Moran to talk about one of art history's and indeed the world's greatest and well-known paintings. It really wouldn't be an art history podcast, particularly an art history podcast season one, if I didn't have an episode dedicated to this particular painting. As you've seen from the title, yep, today we are going to be talking about the incredible Mona Lisa. Now, you may be surprised to hear that the Mona Lisa is completely steeped in history and for one small painting it certainly has more than one interesting story attached to the history of this piece. It's one of Leonardo da Vinci's greatest works and of course people queue out of the Louvre in Paris every single day to see this incredible work. If you've been lucky enough to travel to Paris and see the work for yourself then you'll be fully aware that it isn't actually a large painting, it's quite small. It's also near enough impossible to get to in the Louvre between bulletproof glass, 25 feet of barriers and then of course 4,000 other people trying to take a photo on a selfie stick. But as you'll see from my talk with Celia, who speaks so beautifully and passionately about the story that surrounds the Mona Lisa and everything that this painting has been through in its lifespan, I think you'll learn to appreciate it a little bit more. On this podcast, we talk about the origins of the work, its history of being attacked, when it was stolen, and then we round off the episode very nicely by sharing some fun facts and conspiracy theories which surround the painting. So I would definitely recommend that you stick around for that. This work is a symbol of France, so I feel very privileged that I was able to sit down with a French national and have them give their opinion on what it means to them. Just a word of warning before we continue, when Celia and I sat down to record this episode, there was some sort of commotion going on in the room next to us um, at about 12 to 17 minutes in. I've tried my best where possible to lower the the volume um, but there's there is still you, you can still hear it in the background but it's only for a short period of time and then you go back to it so if you get bored listening about the Mona Lisa you can always listen to what these people are arguing about in the background if you can make it out. Anyway just sit back and relax as Celia and I discuss the history of the Mona Lisa. And you were, you were 14, 15? Yeah, no, 13 or 14. Okay. Yeah, I was really young and she was so small. <laughs> That's it though. Like, yeah, but I, I had the same reaction as many other people because when you see her, you imagine she will be bigger because she's such a big work of art in art history. Well, that said. And it. You, you just have this tiny piece in this huge box of glass and you have thousands of people around you with their phone or stick or thing like that. It was not already the... The, the selfie time. stick yeah. craze, oh my gosh. But people were taking pictures of this one. And it was, yeah, I was more impressed by the painting next to it. Um, what's the name of this one? The, the Madonna on the Rocks, is No, no, it's Linas de Cana. Oh, is it uh, not Raphael? Oh, no, God. it's Veronese. Oh, I think it's Veronese. Let's oh, my goodness. Quick. But yeah, the, I, I remember... I, I, I stopped in front of this huge painting because it's one of it's the hugest yeah. painting in the Louvre. And you have this huge one and this tiny one. I was like, but why people are just looking at Mona Lisa when they have this incredible yes. thing next to it? Oh, it that's was, it. That's it. It's um because I remember the first time I saw it, I was twenty one and um I'd gone for my I'd gone to Paris for my twenty first um to go to Disneyland Paris, not to go to the Louvre, even though I was an art <laughs> history student. <laughs> To go to Disneyland Paris, had my priorities in check, and my sister and I were like really excited. We got up dead early because obviously you have to queue for like a fortnight to get in because it's just like they do it really well, like the build up to get into the Louvre. Like you've got this like beautiful old historic palace right on the Seine. Oh right, this is the one that's next to it, the wedding feast at Cana. Oh my gosh! And this, this <sighs> just 
huge. And it's in the same room as Mona Lisa. And you have those huge amount of people. That's amazing. In one painting. Do you know, it just shows you how, like, underwhelmed I was after seeing them. Because <laughs> I remember my sister and I, like, we were like, oh, because, like, obviously it's, like, signposted the whole way that you yeah. go in. And we were, like, really excited. We were like, oh, we're full. And obviously we went through the ancient Egyptian section. Mm-hmm. And this was my, this is when I got a bit of a beef with the Louvre because I was kind of, like... Initially, I was like, we'll go to the mummy room. And then we went to see all the mummies. There's maybe like 75 mummies. And I, and then we went into a tomb that they had literally like brick by brick taken apart and rebuilt in the Louvre. And then we got lost and ended up in the basement of an actual castle, like the, I get a medieval castle yeah, that they'd take. The original, the original castle, because Le Louvre was a, an important place in Paris. Mm-hmm. It was where the first castle were built. So you have the medieval and then they've been building up more things oh. because the Louvre was a castle before Versailles was such a big thing. Oh, so this is where, is that where Louis was then? Was was this palace um, before he chose Versailles? Yeah, his... I can't really remember in which way it is in, in because you have the Tuileries too, which is another castle that's not existing anymore mm-hmm. because it, was, it has been demolished in the 19th century. But the Louvre was primarily a state castle. It was where the king was oh, living. Oh, see, already teaching me so much, Celia. There you go. But yeah, so we saw this castle and I was like, went th- again, ended up back in the ancient Egyptian section and I was like, is there anything left in Egypt? Like, why would I ever need to go? I've seen it all here. And then I got really annoyed and then we like sort of followed like the illustrated signs, which I think is one of the only museums I've ever been into personally, where it's literally like, here's an image of the work that you're looking for this way, whereas they kind of just normally like list it or it's kind of lost within a room. Yeah. And when I saw it, my sister and I were like, is, is that it? Is that what all the fuss is about? Which, I don't know, I think like kind of like what you said, like you build it up in your head as to be this like, because it's so universally known, mm-hmm. I think you could go anywhere and show someone a photo of it and I would bet my life that they would know of it or maybe at least know the artist or that it will be yeah, familiar to them. emotion watching it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's just, it's such an interesting painting. But it also has a very interesting history. Despite being an absolute, as we would say in Scotland, pint size, absolutely tiny, tiny piece. So, so you're going to talk to me a little bit about the history of the Mona Lisa, which I'm really excited about because you wrote this amazing blog post. Thank you. <laughs> and because it kind of, the blog post came out of a discussion that we had. Yeah, it was just about... The... A, a fun fact that we'll mention later. Yes, um, but I was so surprised by, by this fun fact. I was like, okay, let's dig a little bit more and find information. And I found amer- amazing articles about Mona Lisa, how she travelled through time, how she became famous, what happened to her, and the little mystery we could also have about it. So it's just fantastic, and I think it's a nice way for you to learn a bit more about no, totally. Mona Lisa or La Joconde, as we call her in French. Which blows my mind that I just, <laughs> like I said to you before we we started I I didn't even just because it's universally known as the Mona Lisa I had no idea that it would be called something else in French <laughs> yeah yeah in French it, she's more known in France as La Joconde rather than Mona Lisa because I think Mona Lisa is the way for people to to name it in English or right. in other languages and uh but no it's it's La Joconde in French so if I do mistake during the podcast my apologies. No, just... you, listen, uh, <laughs> you call it whatever you want. <laughs> um, so just in case anyone hasn't seen this painting, and just for everyone listening, all the images that we refer to throughout the podcast will be available via my Instagram page. I'll leave a link to them in the show notes and also on my website as well if, you, if you're if you not partial to an Instagram, which is absolutely fine. Just to sort of get the ball rolling, describe the... Mona Lisa to me and maybe by the end of it I'll be I'll, uh, I'll dust off my old French and uh, <laughs> and try and call it by the French name <laughs> let's try that if you go on the Louvre website and if you have a look at its title it's not Mona Lisa it's portrait of Lisa Gherardini so um, it's not even La Joconde or Mona Lisa it's portrait of Lisa Gherardini house mm-hmm. of Francesco del Giocondo okay 
as you can hear, Jocondo, Joconde, ooh, tiny link between the two. Okay. And it's from that that we got the name. It's from her husband's name that we named her La Joconde. La Joconde, okay. Yeah. So it's a tiny painting if you look at the dimension because um, it's 77 centimeters by 53. Okay. So it's really tiny. It's smaller than human size, mm-hmm. I would say. So when you're facing it, it's like really surprising because you have this idea that it could be so big because of its place in art in general. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to see is that it is the first painting in time with a smile on it. Really? The first one ever? Yeah, because before that, we had the the obligation for noble people Mm -hmm. to stay closed in emotion I would say right okay it mm-hmm. was it was for many points showing teeth mm-hmm. was quite bad because dentistry was not that good at that time right so okay showing teeth would be bad but it was also linked with the vices showing the mouse it was an exit sort of thing oh. and you don't have to open open the op- the, the yeah the, the offensive all oh, right okay ah so you have to, so it was better if you just mm-hmm. kept your mouth closed yeah and staying really Really closed in emotion was a way for people to show how important they were. Ah, oh, okay. So, so dead, dead yeah. to the world and emotion-wise meant uh, you were a big deal. Yeah, so Mona Lisa is one of the exceptions through art history. It's not a proper smile, as we can mention. Mm-hmm. And after Mona Lisa, the, the most famous one will be one with um, Elisabeth Vigier Le Brun. Okay. So she painted, she, she made a self-portrait, but she, she also, she's more famous for painting uh, Marie Antoinette and her child. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. And on this one, there is a smile. And from that date, so 1783, I would say, something like okay, that. Okay, okay. We start to see smiles and painting spaces. Before that, in portrait, people were not showing their teeth or ah. any amazing or funny faces. So this smile has been has been an enigma for tons of people because we don't know why she is smiling. So the historian would say, "Oh, it's because she's uh, hiding a pregnancy, or oh. it could be because she's she's just happy to be here, or she's trying." to have more attention from Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. We don't really know. It's still a, it's, it's still an enigma and we'll probably never know. You see this, I would not say gorgeous because I do not find her really pretty, mm-hmm. but you see this this woman who was considered at some point point as a femme fatale oh okay um, in the 19th century and it's from that point that she became a little bit more known mm-hmm. because before that she was not that famous so she was bought by francis the first from leonardo da vinci she was bought in 1524 1524 and yes. she was it's estimated that she, she da vinci was, painted her Historian, I'm not sure, but it would be between 1903 and 1513. 13, yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Could be something like that, but we're n- they're not really sure of that because we have drawings of Raphael, sketches that mimic the painting, so it's quite hard to see. It was inspired by what Leonardo da Vinci was painting at the time. Ah, oh, right, okay. Else. She was bought from Francis I. Okay, so Francis I was... A- King in France. The king in France. Yeah. Okay. He is the the king of the Renaissance. I oh, okay. He's the major one. He's the one who introduced art mm-hmm. to the court and who made art more popular ah, in the court. So okay. he's, he's quite important for that. And he loved what Leonardo da Vinci was doing. Okay. So he got plenty of his paintings. Some ah. of them are now in the Le Louvre. So you can see them there. And um, Da Vinci was also was his uh, court painter at, yes. at one time as well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is really interesting because he was in Florence when he painted this, mm-hmm. and then ended up in France. Yeah, he, he ended it in France after fifteen fifteen. Yeah, because uh, you had those big Italian wars where French people were trying to get some territories in Italy, and Francis the first was really successful. And after that, he asked Leonardo da Vinci to come with him to France and became a painter of the court. Very nice sort of upgrade. Yes, so it's a nice nice position for Leonardo da Vinci. And he's, I think he, he was one of the first foreigner artists to be part of the, the, the artist court. Ah, okay, so the first foreigner painter, the first foreign painter. He, Leonardo oh, da Vinci sure. is not just painter, he's also a scientist. This scientific, is true. And it's 
Yeah, at that time it was what he was famous for. Was his signs, not his not his paintings? Yeah, because he has not made plenty of paintings. Right, okay. Just few. We've seen what it was when Salvador Mundi came on. Yeah, on well, that is a whole different podcast in and of itself. Okay, so it was bought by Francis the First. Yes. This was after Leonardo passed away? Or was this uh, yeah, during after, his lifetime? He, he after passed he passed away, away in 1519, so okay. five years after. Okay. So he bought it from uh, Leonardo da Vinci's assistant, and it stayed in the royal collection for a long time. Mm-hmm. Napoleon I asked Mona Lisa to be presented in Josephine's bedroom. Really? Yeah, yeah. So it was part of the royal collection. Oh, of course. And the royals were using it as decoration. So it's really interesting to see that. So this was in this so, was in his his wife's or partner's yeah. partner. Wow, that's amazing. So then where where did it go after because Napoleon was obviously mm-hmm. exiled. Yeah, and... so before that, when the Louvre was open to public, because it was one of the first museums to open to public in France oh. uh, after the French Revolution, uh, it was already exhibited there. But there were it it was present in this huge room, tons of painting. You could have a slight idea of that in the Wallace Collection in London, for example. When you go to this huge room with paintings all over the wall, yeah, it was presented this way. In the Louvre at that time. So interesting when you consider how very sort of minimalist museums like to go, but it's always quite shocking when you look back and see that because it literally used to be from like near enough floor to ceiling mm-hmm. and frames, they had no space between them. It's frame to frame. Yeah, as and much. Huge frames too. Yeah, absolutely. The frames were not that small at the time. So, so yeah, you had Mona Lisa surrounded by thousands of other paintings and she became more and more famous. But it took time, actually, through time to go there. And she moved to several rooms in the museums. Okay. So she, she started in the Grande Galerie, the biggest one, which was full of painting. And then we moved her because she was a major work. And they wanted to to separate masterpiece to other paintings. Oh. So they've been collecting all masterpieces and they've put them in the Salon Carré. It is this image. So this is the second image yes, that we're looking at? this is the second image. So this room is smaller, but it's surrounded by astonishingly famous paintings. You, yeah, if you have a look on this one, you can see Veronese, you can see other uh, Da Vinci, you have uh, Raphael's. So all big Italian names yeah. of that time are in this room. But what I didn't notice about this image, until you pointed it out to me, so when Celia sent me these images to sort of like use as a springboard for the podcast, when she sent me this, I was like, the Mona Lisa is not in this photo. Okay, we'll go with it. There's probably a story behind it. And I will publicly apologise to you because it is in it. And it just kind of goes to say what we're saying at the start of the podcast. It is tiny. So for anyone listening, if when you look at these images, this is this huge, grand room, heavily decorated. Um, There's two rows of paintings. And to the bottom right hand side, there's this one large painting and then there's a row of smaller ones underneath it. And if you count back from the right hand corner, one, two, three, four. So the fourth one back, the tiniest is the Mona Lisa. There you are. So I would thoroughly encourage you to go online and have a look at this. So still a masterpiece, but not deserving of her own wall. Yeah, she. we have to wait uh, 1920 for Mona Lisa to have a space of her own. Oh. Not a full space of her own, but to have more space for her. I would say, because in 1920, she moved to La Grande Galerie again. Okay. But this time, there was space. So it, she was not stuck with other paintings. She was surrounded by two smaller paintings to make her look bigger. But she was there. <laughs> and then in 1960s, because she was becoming so famous, we moved her to where she is nowadays. So in La, Ga- La Salle des Etats. The, it's the, this big room which welcomes the biggest works mm-hmm. in the Louvre. So yeah, from that time, it's how she moved in the museum itself through time. Okay, so she's had quite a good sort of shift around um, to sort of find her place yeah. in the Louvre. But if we take it back to the image that we, we were just talking about there, the, um, where I couldn't see her, this links on quite nicely to the second image that you sent yeah. me and anyone listening to this will be like how could you not put two and two together um it's a close-up of the wall mm-hmm. and there's 
two images and then a big gap in the middle and just four what looks like nails in the wall. Yeah. So Celia, what what is this? <laughs> This is probably the biggest drama the Louvre had to overcome through time. On August the 21st, 1911, when a French painter came to the gallery because he was doing a copy of Mona Lisa, because mm -hmm. it was quite normal at that time for painters to, come, to go in the galleries and do copies of this work, he realized Mona Lisa was missing. So he went and asked security what happened. And security was like, oh, don't worry, they might be doing some photography of the work, so it will be back soon. The security thought that it would be a nice idea to go and ask what was going on. Yeah. And they realized the painting has been stolen. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it cool. <laughs> Super cool. So, yeah, it's, it's so surprising how cool it was. No stress before they realized it was stolen, because after that it became quite quite the mess yeah and, yeah and they didn't actually what i think is quite astounding is they didn't alert the police or anybody like that straight away they were like there is no way a thief could have gotten out with this painting they will still be here we will find it and so everyone was very quietly asked to start looking yeah and then they closed the, the they, loop yeah they closed the loop for a full week which hindsight not a great idea if you if you think someone already in the loop <laughs> has the work to then ask everyone to voluntarily leave anyway hindsight's a great thing i'm sure at the time it made sense yeah so they closed the museum for one week and when they realized it has been stolen the director resigned yeah it's been really complicated because they were trying they found the frame and the glaze of the painting. Yeah. Um, and that was in it. Was that a stairwell or something that they had found the painting? Because it was only until then. They were still convinced for a while that it would still yeah. be hidden. Yes, absolutely. And it wasn't until they found the empty frame that they had that horrible... Yeah, they realised it has been stolen. So, yeah, it was so intense for them. So many newspaper. When it became known, when mm -hmm. it was published, it was such a catastrophic information. People were running to the museum to see the empty space. Well, that's it. Yeah, it, it, it actually upped visits to the museum. And it wasn't like a short, oh, all lived happily ever and after. They found it really quickly. It was missing for ages. <laughs> yeah, it, it was missing for two full years. Two full years. Incredible. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the thief was actually a museum worker. He was a glazier. So he's the one who created the glaze for Mona Lisa. Okay. So he knew how to remove it without damaging the painting. Because it's quite a fragile one. So yeah. It's really important to know how to handle it. Mm. So he knew how to do it. And he just removed it from the frame, hide it with, like, um, material. Okay. And exit the museum like he would do normally. Yeah. He had the painting under his arm. Arm, sorry. And just went away. And just left. Yeah. So yeah, it took two years for people to find the painting. He actually contacted um, an art dealer in Italy, the, the thief, mm -hmm. named himself Leonardo, and he sent this message to the art dealer saying, oh, I have, I have the painting you're looking for, how about we meet and I can show you the painting. The art dealer was like, okay, let's do that. But the art dealer also, tried, the art dealer also contacted police and other specialists who could help him to identify the work. So the name of this guy is Vincenzo. Perugia. So he went to Italy. He is an Italian. You can hear it from his name. Yeah. From his name. He went back to Italy and tried to sell the work to the art dealer in Florence. The art dealer and the specialist realized that they were facing the real Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. So they quickly called the police and Vincenzo Perugia was arrested. Uh, but then it doesn't end there. There's this whole sort of humiliation that continues for the Louvre when the police start to question. Yeah, because Vincenzo Perugia was interviewed by police mm -hmm. before that, but they never realised he had it. Well, that's it. It was hidden under his bed. So they've accused other major names, French major names, like uh, Apollinaire, or even more famous for international listener, Pablo Picasso. They've been both arrested. Questioned. and Yeah, questioned. Yeah, because there was... um. Pablo Picasso was very known for being not sticky fingered, but not very honest in how he acquired some art. And he'd already had a run in with the police because he had acquired sculptures. Antique sculptures. Yeah, antique sculptures from the Louvre, which he claimed he had 
absolutely no idea came from the Louvre, despite the fact there was a label underneath that clearly said property of the Louvre. So he played it cool. But yeah, so they were questioned separately because these two were very good friends. Yes, they, they were good friends at that time. <laughs> Not so much after the questioning, but Definitely. it very quickly... Yeah, because they sold each other. I don't know if you could say that in English. Uh, but... Yeah, or we say threw each other under the bus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. So they said Picasso was the brain behind the, the, operation. Other, yeah, yeah. the operation and Apollinaire was the one handling people and asking Ah, uh, okay, so are the puppet master of the operation. Interesting, okay. But um, it was Vince- Vincenzo? Vincenzo Perugia. It, it was Vincenzo, he was caught, and mass celebration, but yes. it didn't return to Louvre straight away. No, no, it stayed in Italy for a while, because um, when Vincenzo Perugia was questioned, and people asked him why in Italy, and in his mind, his reason was... It's because Napoleon I stole it to Italian people and because it's a, a representation of Italy. It's, it's a masterpiece that belongs to Italy. It needs to go back to Italy. So because of that, his punishment was just one year of, one year of prison. A year, that was it? Yeah, because it was a patriotic act. And was he in prison in France or in Italy? Oh, I don't know that. Well, that's something... Tell you what, if I find it, I will, I will leave a link in the show notes. But... um. How interesting. I, do you know what? I've never even... Because I've heard of, obviously, that it had been stolen mm-hmm. and that the thief was caught. But I never have thought past of what happened to the, the thief afterwards. So the painting stayed in Italy for a while because it was in Italy. Let's enjoy it. So it did a little tour of the biggest galleries there and it <laughs> went back to France. Where it's been ever since? Um, no, because it moved again. In the 60s and later in the 70s. Oh. And that's it. Okay. That. okay. So yeah, in the 60s, it's a link to our third image. Our third image. Third okay. image. Okay, so this is quite a surprising... Again, I had no idea, I had absolutely no idea that this was even a thing. What you see in the image is... This is President John F. Kennedy sort of addressing the people at what I'm assuming is the White House or some sort of conference. No, where is he? No, it's the National Gallery in oh, Washington, in the na- Oh, well, there you are. Photograph. <laughs> <laughs> so you see President Kennedy presenting a speech mm-hmm. to people in the room. And next to him, you have the Mona Lisa. <laughs> Which is quite surprising <laughs> when you know how hard it is nowadays to move Mona Lisa out of the museum. It is no, it's impossible to remove Mona Lisa from the Louvre. Well, that's it. And my first question is, how on earth did it get to America? And <laughs> what, how? Just how did that even happen? In what I found about this one is that Jackie Kennedy, mm-hmm. she, she was really into culture. Okay. And she really wanted to have Mona Lisa in the US just to show, show it to the world. And um, at some point she invited uh, the cultural minister of France in the US and okay. during the discussion she was maybe a little bit flirty but she used her charms mm-hmm. I would say to convince Malraux who was the, the, the culture minister, yeah mm-hmm. the culture minister to lend the peace to the US and he accepted it was an also drama but this time not in the Louvre but in France in general because why on the hearse would you leave <laughs> the masterpiece and let it go to, to the US. But yeah, it, it left there. It was a high security trip. Well, that's it. And it, um, so it left it left France under very sort of mm-hmm. tight lock and key security. Nobody could get at it. And it, it actually made its way to the US via a very beautiful and elaborate French uh, ship liner. Yeah, a new Russian liner at that time, the SS France. Okay. And the Mona Lisa had her own, had her own suite. In the boat. So first class, security, everything's fine. She went, she arrived there, she was more than well well welcome because 1.7 million people queued to see Mona Lisa and we estimate that people stayed and stared at her for 20 seconds. Not much. No, no more. No more than 20 seconds. Yeah, because the amount of people and the shortest time she was here and everything, it's... Do you know what that actually, it's kind of like a modern day 
kasama mirror room actually do you know that way when you go in and you only if anyone doesn't know what a kasama um mirror room is it's this it's an artist that does these beautiful sort of mirrored installation rooms and they're either filled with like pumpkins or lights and whenever they are shown anywhere in the world the queue is not only around the corner but it's so long that you get about 20 to 30 seconds and that is it Mm -hmm. so kind of like a modern day yeah kasama then actually with with the frenzy it was a huge success and um yeah at that time so because it showed in washington first and then it made its way to to new york for a short time too uh yeah which is just amazing and i i read that it was insured at the time so this was 1962 for a hundred million dollars from your blog you have included this incredible quote which again completely blew my mind in another in another way so i have it here and it says this was john f kennedy um addressing people what i'm assuming at the the washington uh, yeah. when he at the unveiling at the yes and he says this painting is the second lady that the people of france have sent to the usa now celia what is the first lady that france have sent to the usa the statue of liberty so this, do you know, this is one of these things that I was like, did I know this? Did I know this? Because it rings a bell, but it was also like, what? Yeah, it was a... Because, because it's an, emble- uh, an emblem for the US. The Statue of Liberty is an, emble- an emblem to the US. Mm-hmm. So having friends sending them the Mona Lisa would have been like friends sending them the Eiffel Tower. Because it's as famous and as important in the cultural landscape of a country. So it's really interesting. And if you go back to Paris and in other places uh, in France, you can see copies or smaller version of the Statue of Liberty. Just... Yeah, because there's one on the scene actually, now that you've said this. Um, but yeah, so it was um, just as a sort of side fun fact, the Statue of Liberty was presented to the Americans in 1886 I have that it was that it was um installed in New York but it was to symbolize their alliance during the American Revolution in sort of the latter half of the 1700s and that famously is when as Britain it was still a British colony under the rule of George the third and that is what George the third is very famous well very famously known for as the king that lost the Americas but anyway, an amazing photo and amazing that it attracted so many yeah, people. Yeah, but it, it was also, so this was in the 60s, it came back to France and then Japan asked to lend the work. Okay. So it went to Japan in 1974, 1.5 million people went to visit this exhibition. So it was another huge success. Yeah, she can pull a crowd, let's be honest, Mona Lisa, Mona, oh, yes. she can pull a crowd. Yeah, even nowadays when you know how many people come daily to see her Mm. do you have a rough idea of how many people come i read it was oh gosh i had about twenty thousand. Thirty thousand people 30 oh my gosh that's bonkers 80 percent of the visitors in the louvre come just to see mona lisa and that's the thing it's it's also it's not cheap to get into the louvre either it's about 30 euro to get in but then again i suppose it's one of these amazing cultural phenomenons where you just you have to see it it's one of these sort of bucket list situations um oh my gosh so yeah so japan was a huge success when Lisa also visited the ussr mm-hmm. during cold war even if it's the end okay. which is russia russia yeah, yeah no ussr is nowadays Russia, Moscow. just in case. Yeah, in Moscow. So it stopped in Moscow because when when the Louvre was planning to send Mona Lisa to Japan, mm-hmm. Air France had to fly it above Russia to go there oh, and need okay. permission. And the only way Russia would give permission to France to take this road was to lend peace for some time in Russia. That is sneaky, but very good. A very good sort of bargaining chip. So yeah, so it stayed there and crazy to imagine that Mona Lisa did those two trips and after that, nothing. Well, that's it. But the, there is speculation around the fact that when she returned from Russia, mm-hmm. she was damaged. Yeah, um, it's, it's quite complicated. Mona Lisa has been painting on the wood panel 
it's a really fragile one oh. and it has a huge crack in the back right and traveling within different climates mm-hmm. and things and the air conditioning in the plane and things like that even if it's quite controlled in some way it can still be damaging and it's moving and well, you yeah. don't know what's happening and also because because it's on wood which i didn't know either i just i don't know why i just assumed it was on canvas but of course it's on board for, for when it was made but also wood expands mm-hmm. and contracts with with the heat yeah. with heat and coolness if anyone doesn't doesn't know that so that's why it's in this incredible case nowadays mm-hmm. like yeah. heavily climate controlled and it's just yeah so it arrived back damaged and they just they not said not really damaged but they decided to keep the sco- the the painting there and also because it's a huge way for the museum to get money well that's true that is true. So, I mean 30,000 le- yeah. people less a day yeah lending the painting would be a huge loss for the museum mona so that's her she's back safe but and that's where she's been she's safe and sound in the Louvre. This is where you'll find her. Mm-hmm. And legally in France, she's not allowed to move. It is it is against the law that she's removed from France. Yeah, it has to stay there, which is incredible. But um, it's got a bit of a she's had a bit of a rough time. She's not yeah. been loved by everybody. No, um, not really. she's had a couple of um run-ins with people, <laughs> and she's actually been attacked a few times. Uh, so Celia, you. You have um, some examples of times when she's been attacked. Yeah, so go on, so... what have terrible people done to poor Mona? <laughs> so before before trip in the US in 1956, a Bolivian boy came to the museum and threw a stone at it. So it damaged it damaged the painting. Um, maybe you will I will send it. the image. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. So this image that we're talking about, um, it is Mona, but with a horrendous crack to sort of on her elbow on her elbow at the sort of bottom right of the canvas i mean and it was a small child that did this that threw it what was a child that no, threw it's, it? it's not a child it was it just was a, a boy working in a cafe in paris oh right okay yeah, and he, he explained that he has so much anger against the painting that he just needed to attack it okay and then this is when they decided ah we're gonna we're gonna yeah, give it some to, better glass yeah. <laughs> To move it and put more security around it, even if it had glass before, but it was how to prevent that to happen again. Well, there we are. Then in Japan, 1974. Uh, yeah, when she was on her holiday. Yeah. Uh, a lady threw some red painting on Mona Lisa. She put red paint on her. Yeah. Yeah, so she was of course protected, but she threw painting on the, on the glass that okay. was there. Uh, just because she were she was thinking that the um, yeah. handicapped people were really bad handle for this exhibition. Also, oh, so it was a protest for the lack of like disabled access. Accessibility. I mean, if you're going to protest, it's a good protest. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's a way to be. But the work was fine. Yeah, it survived. It she learned. Nothing happened yeah. to her at that time. She was protected. People were, people knew what to do. Mm-hmm. And more recently. Uh, in 2009, a Russian lady threw an empty mug at Mona Lisa. And this is, is this, she threw, like an empty like tea mug? Yeah, it was a tea mug, but she threw it at Mona Lisa for no reason. We, she never gave a proper expl- explanation why she did it. But this was already in that, by that point in time, she had this ridiculous um, yeah, measure. Yeah, in 2009, she was already in this big, in this big box. Well, that's it. And, and you can't even get anywhere near her as well. Mm-hmm. So, Mona Lisa, uh, as a survivor, yeah, there you are. She's, she's, a, a survivor, she's been through the she's wars. She's a traveller. She's, <laughs> she's everything. She's everything you could want in a woman and more. Yeah, she's an icon. Well, that's it. Which very <laughs> nicely um, leads us on to sort of our last sort of section talking about Mona. So as you are well aware by now, this is a painting that is steeped in history and is beloved by millions, but it also has a lot of interesting fun facts but also a lot of um conspiracy theories around it as well and this is how you ended your blog post which i will leave a link to in the description for anyone that wants to that wants to read it and i just loved it so celia um could you tell us your 
wonderful fun facts sure. about Mona. <laughs> so the first fact we can learn about Mona Lisa is that Joconde in French comes from Giocondo, which means happy in Italian. Oh, okay, okay, so... so... it was the nickname of her husband, and she took it from him. So, Jocon La Joconde La is from Giocondo. Giocondo, which is happy. There you are, which maybe explains the mystery behind the Probably. smile. Or... That's true. Mm-hmm. Okay. You may have fun. I may have cracked it. I may have cracked it, people. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> um... So nowadays, the second fact I will mention is that nowadays the value of Mona Lisa is probably estimated around several billion euros. Okay, great. So it's just impossible for people just to imagine buying it. And it's also forbidden for friends to sell it. There, there was some discussion at some point to try and sell Mona Lisa to pay some French debt. No. Yes, they did, but because she's the masterpiece and some, yeah, she, she's an icon of France, no, not an icon. Yeah, no, I, so symbol, I, I, symbol, symbol and icon, absolutely. She, mm-hmm. she has an icon, she's incredible. And the, so is it by law that she's not allowed to be sold? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really clever. I do, like, and I, I think... Because they're part of the French museum's collection. collection, so it's just part of the French museum. Okay, good fun fact. Um, Put your wallets away. <laughs> <laughs> the third fa- fact I would mention is that Mona Lisa still has people working for her. Oh. Every day, at least six people are working for her security. She has her own security team. Yeah, the one in the, the room. Okay. But also video security and all things around it. Well, there you are. Not only Success. is she an, an well proper icon in status then if you have people working for you and yeah. you're painting. Yeah. <laughs> Fourth fact. Okay. Mona Lisa has her own mailbox. It is, it is the fact that pushed me to write this article. But when I discovered that, I was like, that's incredible she has her own mailbox people can write to her so she received love letters so many times she received wedding questions and yeah wedding questions it's i don't know it's um yeah so she's she receives like proposals yeah proposals love letters um i i personally um this is this is one of the first facts i'd ever learned about the mona lisa is that she had a post her own post box and it just it blew my mind I mean I've never personally felt the need to like write to me too so. uh, a painting but um maybe we just haven't met the right one <laughs> maybe maybe um another interesting fact is that Mona Lisa's face has no hair on it yes so this is something I didn't realize until I read this fact and it's true (laughs) and by that you mean of course she has hair on her head but she has no eyelashes she has no eyebrows and go away and look at it because you're going to be like how because it's something that you don't notice and then once you see it Mm -hmm. you can't unsee it (laughs) yeah another fact there are not one but plenty joconde throughout the world Oh, ah, yeah. okay. And if you go and have a look, you can find really similar painting in Madrid, in Norway, in Baltimore, Maryland, USA, and also one in the Hermitage Museum in, in Russia. Really? And if you observe those paintings, they're really, really similar. So they've, nev- they've never been attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. Mm-hmm. They're attributed, they are attributed to... His studio or... Yeah, his studio, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's just really interesting to see the the several versions of Mona Lisa. And the last but not least, the Musée Condé in Mm -hmm. France has a version of Mona Lisa naked. No. Yeah, there is a naked version of Mona Lisa. You don't really see a breast or anything like that. But it is a drawing, so we don't know if it's a preparation before or after. Okay. And her hair is sort of like down and covering her modesty, as we would say. Not really. I Not really. Oh well, here we go. <laughs> oh wow! And they think is it? And this this is attributed to Leonardo. Um. So anyone that's uh, so this is essentially just. Mona. I mean, her face is very different, though. Yeah, and she has a problem with her eyes, so it might be just a preparatory drawing. Ah, uh, right. Okay, so like um, like and, a sketch and by she's Leonardo. She's naturally feminine because she has really strong arm. Yeah, so yeah. So we don't know if it's an androgyne version of Mona Lisa or just another person. 
on the painting. But right. it, it has been named the Naked Jaconda. Well, since you said that was your last fun fact, I too have some fun facts and a conspiracy theory, which uh, I'm going to share with you because it's Joe's art history. And I love a fun fact. If you follow my Instagram, I love posting. I do. I post a sculpture and a painting, and then I also post a fun fact mm -hmm. because I love a fun fact. So my fun fact leads on very nicely from your last one. And it is a conspiracy that the Mona Lisa is actually a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci in drag. <laughs> yes, we, we don't know. Because it also could be one of his assistants. We, we don't know. Well, that's it. And um, there's online, there are these amazing um, sort of overlaps. There's a very famous pencil drawing, like self-portrait of Leonardo. And they very cleverly sort of mirrored them on top of each other, which of course you can manipulate and do anything on Photoshop nowadays. Um, uh, but I would say go and have a look at it. It, it. it tips you in the, oh, it could be. So this may be the very first depiction within art history of a man in drag. So there you are. That's my first fun fact. The second is that it is not in its original frame, um, which might not sound surprising, but there's been conservation work done to it. And the frame that it's currently in, it's been, has been its frame since 1909, but conservation work has been done and it's been put in several frames over its lifetime. And in it's- In 1911 too. Oh, in 1911 as well. It was no, a because of the, of the, of the- Ah, mistake. well, there you are then. So yeah, so all. So several frames, but its edges have also been trimmed at least once in its life. So the painting's edges have been trimmed at least once to fit it into a frame. So there you are. So it's had several frames and it's also been trimmed, but they do say that none of the layers of paint have been cut into, just sort of excess board. And my final fun fact, which is actually a huge conspiracy theory, and there's a really excellent um, episode of this on a podcast called The Art Curious, where they sort of delve into this in way more detail than what we're going to just do now. But um, And I'll leave a link to that in the show notes as well. That it's believed that the Mona Lisa, Mona, who rakes in 30,000 30, visitors a day, is actually a fake. <laughs> <laughs> It what do you so weird? What do you think of this? As a French national, how does this make you feel? It can be true. Really? No. Do you think so? No, <laughs> no you don't think it's, it's French true. part speaking. Now it would be really surprising to be true. Yeah. Because they're just spending so much time just checking the painting all the time. They yeah. they moved it in the museum a few months ago, sorry. Because they were redoing the um, the, the room and they moved it at that time and they've done checks to see if everything was fine and it would be really weird for them not to realize it's a fake one yeah well there's another conspiracy theory that the it's the louvre that actually decided after it was stolen that it was so precious and so there's there's two actually so it was once one is after it was stolen in 1911 mm -hmm. and returned in 1913 they thought oh actually this is really precious um let's put a really good copy out and we'll keep the one locked away a uh, second time when these rumors started to sort of flare up that it could be a copy was when it was sent away during world war Two. Mm -hmm. obviously the nazis were advancing on france and what they did was and it was a sort of a worldwide thing where museums and churches cleared out their sort of precious belongings and um, if it was a church, for example, stained glass windows were removed and they were all put into storage in vaults and... In castles that were not in near the, the front. Yeah, exactly. And this is when they decided that, um, that well, the conspiracy theory is that at one point they sent a fake Mona Lisa to an inventory registered uh, vault that everything was going to be kept in and that if the Nazis, you know, invaded and got to the Louvre, which they did, they would be able to track down where Mona was. So the idea was that they sort of scurried her off in a different direction. So like classic decoy move. Um, which is just so interesting and from one painting it just like the history this is what I, I love about art history is you can see a painting and think that's all there is to know it's, it's a person with a bit of a background and she's famous because she's got a bit of a bit of a smirk going and it's this 
unbelievable, huge tale that stretches mm-hmm. centuries and is always so interesting, even to modern day standards. It's, she just keeps... Yeah, we keep discovering information about her. Well, that's it. Forget yeah, the, the Kardashians, guys. This yeah. is the original it, girl. Yeah, Here yeah, we yeah. go. The latest, latest trend about her was to publish how healthy or not she was. And <laughs> American doctors realized that she was really sick, but they've not thought about the varnish. <laughs> so, well, that's it, because uh, varnish... Uh, cause they, well, they... She looked really yellow. She's not really... So is that why they thought she was sick? Yeah, yeah, so they thought she had a problem with a thyroid peeling. <laughs> oh, uh, her thyroid, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they mentioned all her problems from a painting, and because of her, her skin was yellowish, <laughs> she was really sick. But or yeah. it's just sun damage because... She's Italian. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's also Italian. Tuscany ta- is really sunny and yeah. hot. She might have a bit of a tan. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I think that is a perfect place to leave it and I hope it's got you guys thinking. Celia, thank you so, so much for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and being so enthusiastic and speaking about Mona Lisa or La Joconde. La Joconde. La, yes, I nailed it, I nailed it. Before you go, um, where can people uh, find this uh, this article and a wee bit more because you, you run a lovely art blog as well yeah i i have a an art blog named la balançoire de fragonard or fragonard swing mm-hmm. inspired by my favorite painting but it's another subject and uh, <laughs> on this one i try to publish as regularly as i can various subjects on on works it could oh. be historical it could be just focusing one on one work yeah an artist and um, I'll leave a link to that in the show notes below and um, as you've probably guessed Celia is French uh, so it, it, the, the yes. blog is, is in French but don't let that stop you Google Translate is an incredible resource and actually yeah, when a few, few articles are in English oh well, there you from, are from the time I was in these days perfect and um, <laughs> but also if you want to practice your French and your art history click away on to Celia's blog. Thank you so, so much. You've been amazing. You've been amazing. Thank you. (laughs) And there you have it, the end of another episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. I would just like to take this opportunity again to thank Celia for being so passionate and generous in both her time and sharing her knowledge on this incredible piece which I hope you have learned a little something or two I definitely walked away feeling way more knowledgeable about the history of this painting than what I did entering into the chat as well as a little bit more about the history of the Louvre as well. During the conversation we discussed the fate of the thief of the Mona Lisa and there's a bit of a back and forth about where he was jailed and it's just to say that he was actually imprisoned in Italy so there you are in case you were wondering that's where he ended up. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure that you like, rate and subscribe. And if you think you know anyone that would enjoy listening or benefit from listening to this podcast, then please do feel free to pass it on. If you would like to get in touch, you can email me, joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram at joesarthistory and you can DM me and get in contact with me that way. All images that we discussed in this podcast will be available to view either on my Instagram page as well as my website and links to that are in the show notes below. Links to Celia's blog, I will not try and butcher the French language in any way more than what I have during this episode. Links to Celia's blog, which is incredibly interesting, are below as well in the show notes. Finally, thank you to you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I did recording it. And I look forward to seeing you next time on the Joe's Art History Podcast. Bye-bye.